friend Dr. Paracalo to present uh, on uh, gynecology in the setting of uh, microsurgery. Um, I always say yes, but I keep wondering, okay, how, how do I do justice to this topic in, in the setting of such a group as this? So um, what he asked me to talk about this time was the evolution of robotic gynecologic surgery. So obviously robotic surgery started in a, in a whole different uh, arena and part of the body and, and for a different purpose. Uh, as it evolved downward towards the pelvis, uh, us, we in gynecology found that there um, could be some uses for it. And so I'd like to talk about where we started and uh, where we're going with it. It's less uh, data heavy and more designed to give you a, a, a picture of what we've been able to do and what we think we can do in the future. These are my disclosures. Um, as you've seen from uh, the professor previously, uh, applications in tubular anastomosis were one of the early uh, obvious applications for robotics uh, in gynecology. Uh, uh, some of us saw the, the application also in uh, hysterectomy, uh, sacral couple pexy, which I'll describe. Uh, and as we've uh, improved uh, our skill base uh, using the robot, we've been able to extend uh, the usage into other areas. And I'll show you briefly a little bit about uh, repair of vesicle vaginal fistulas and how we go after misplaced uh, transvaginal mesh uh, through the abdomen with the robot. Okay, so uh, I wanted to start, uh, I know this is the urology group, I, I guess this is a group of, shall we say, Audis. Uh, I'm gonna talk about an Indy now that's, that's become an Audi, uh, and then you'll see what I mean in a minute. So prolapse uh, in women is partial or completed version of the vagina. What you can see here is the Indy that was supposed to be an inwardly pulled tube anchored apically and laterally to the inside of the pelvis has lost all of its supports. And what you can see going over here is that the support that was designed to hold the vagina and the uterus in, inside uh, totally gone, usually a consequence of uh, childbirth and, and uh, genetic predisposition. Well, this frustrated uh, doctors and providers for centuries, for uh, millennia even, uh, until the aha moment came that really said that prolapse happens because the tube that is the vagina suspended inwards, the suspension is broken, and so because of that, the vagina falls out. It's much like a sock turning inside out on itself. So when you see that loss of support and you understand what the anatomy is, you can ask questions about how you can fix it. Here's a graphic of what uh, I would call here normal support. I think you can see the arrow showing the vagina pulled inward. Here's the uh, pelvis, here's the sacrum here, and here is the um, lateral attachments of the vagina and these are the apical attachments. Prolapse simply is loss of those attachments such that the vagina turns inside out. What I'll show you here is a view from inside uh, the um, abdomen, laparoscopically, robotically. Uh, we're looking at a stent placed inside the vagina, holding the vagina up in place. You can see that here. And what I'll do is I'll just have that stent go out, and you'll see the whole vagina turns inside out and balloons up, out, right? So for the urologist, uh, around here somewhere are the ureters. These are the remnant of the uterus sacral ligaments. Here is our very favorite uh, bladder up here. Uh, and this would be the sacral promontory near the top here. So the whole idea behind prolapse repair is to take that outie, which that which is poking out, and make it uh, come in. We have uh, in our hands a uh, gold standard procedure that's been around since uh, 1970. Uh, uh, one of our doctors stole it from uh, the Germans, uh, and then. Uh, put a lot of data together to show that it's actually 97% effective over a 30 year period in, pre in preventing recurrence of prolapse with complication rates in the right hands of about 5%. This is called the abdominal sacrocolpal pexy. And what you're seeing here is a abdominally placed hernia mesh attached to the front and the back wall of the vagina. And the tail of that graft is pulled up and attached to the sacrum. Uh, scary parts, things about this procedure is that Right over here and here are ureters and the uh, iliac uh, vessels and the aorta bifurcation is probably just about a cent, three or four centimeters up. The procedure is very effective, uh, but has been um, done, uh, when done effectively, it's done by surgeons who are capable and skilled at uh, the anatomy. 
So we started, and we've been really familiar with the open version of the sacral copal pexy. And here I have a laparotomy incision. We showed you the tip of the vagina earlier. This is the sacral promontory here. And what I mean to show you is, this is what we see when we try to do this procedure open. So here I am, trying to put Gore-Tex sutures in the anterior longitudinal ligament of the sacral promontory, which, uh, for those of you that worked in this area, is not a very friendly area anatomically. Over here, I affectionately refer to two and a half liters a minute here, two and a half liters a minute here. These are the uh, common iliacs, vein more prominent on the uh, patient's uh, left side, and artery on the right side. Ureters about three centimeters away on either side, and of course, the uh, bowels the sigmoid colon here. That's what trying to do that procedure open looks like. Here's the vagina here. I've attached uh, uh, some mesh to the vagina and I'm now doing the tail section. And I just show you this by way of uh, comparison. <clears throat> right. Here's that same procedure done during, using the robot. All I'm going after now here is the anterior longitudinal ligament on the sacral promontory. And what you can see is because of the uh, visibility and because of the magnification and the fine operations that we can do with the robotic instruments, this procedure looks a whole lot different. You might almost want to say it looks pretty straightforward. And in fact, one of the things that happens to us uh, in our field as the robotic technology becomes more and more widespread is that surgeons who previously would have been afraid to go after a procedure like this open uh, now feel it oh, well, looks like a video game. I can do this with the robot. And I think that exposes us um, to a challenging space where we have to decide, or doctors and surgeons have to decide who really ought to be doing these procedures. Because as I mentioned, here is about two and a half liters a minute and another two and a half liters a minute over there. Three and a half centimeters from there is the ureter. Uh, it's actually not a uh, very friendly neighborhood if you don't understand uh, your anatomy and surgical principles. So here we are taking the tail of that Y graft uh, and now attaching it to the sutures that I put in the sacral promontory. And again, what I, from what I showed you earlier on the earlier video, it's actually uh, challenging place these sutures, number one, and tie them down uh, using a laparotomy uh, incision. With the robot, it gets to be a whole lot easier. So with the tie down of the two sutures, what we will have accomplished is the attachment of the tail of the graft to the sacral promontory and the uh, whole vagina is pulled into place. Many of us believe that we now want to take and reperitonealize this foreign body so that we effectively hide it from the um, small intestines to reduce the risk of adhesions uh, to, the, to the mesh. Okay, and just for um, comparison, I just wanted to show you what that looks like as we try to do that procedure open. And so if you uh, heard from my colleague who spoke earlier, uh, the challenge, the, the toll on the neck and the back muscles and so on, uh, can be pretty intense if we're doing lots of these uh, procedures, uh, three, sometimes four in a day, uh, two days a week. Here's another approach that's been taken to uh, do this procedure, it's a laparoscopic approach. And again, um, even though we get some of the benefits of uh, endoscopic surgery is still talking about taking a toll on the uh, actual practitioners that are doing the procedure. Uh, for training all of the fellows and trainees that I've trained uh, over the years, and many of you are familiar with this, unless you have dedicated partners, when you do laparoscopy, you're actually doing at least two surgeries. There's the surgery that the camera person thinks is happening, and then there's the surgery that the actual surgeon uh, thinks is happening. And for those of you who have been there, you know that getting the two minds and four hands coordinated uh, actually is quite a bit of a challenge, uh, not to mention the issues related to ergonomics uh, that, um, that can plague laparoscopic uh, endeavors. All right, and so here, just for comparison, you're all familiar, is uh, 
similar, same team, uh, operating robotically to do this procedure, and it looks a whole lot more diff uh, different and comfortable. The other thing that opened for us here is that sometimes we do joint surgeries with our colorectal uh, and urology colleagues, uh, and we can actually have two surgeons uh, sitting at the console operating on the same patient uh, collaboratively. So, um, sacral colpopexy uh, became, if you will, old hat now in uh, gynecology such that urogynecologists are doing some portion of the procedures general gynecologists tend to be doing most of them. In our practice, we do about uh, 180 of these a year. The time frame has come down from six hours at the beginning to four hours where most practices are to, for us, uh, 90 minutes, uh, often less uh, for that procedure. So there has been considerably improvement with uh, requisite decreases in uh, number of uh, days of patient stay. Uh, patients on the average go home within 24 hours uh, with uh, much, much less pain than before. So having gotten good at uh, doing the robotic sacral couple pexy gold standard procedure, uh, what we noticed was that facility with the robot allowed us to contemplate doing procedures that we would not have tried to have done uh, laparoscopically uh, or robotically before. And in some cases, we're doing procedures that we didn't even think we could, we could do. So one of those procedures is vesicular vaginal fissure repair, deference to the urologist in the audience, but in our fellowship when we trained, uh, in your gynecology, this was a big, challenging one-day affair uh, to do one of these. Uh, now with the robot, an appropriate stent placed in the vagina, as you can see here. This post-hysterectomy vesicovaginal fistula is identified with the stent in the fistula, and what we've done is basically cut the vagina open, identify the fistula, separate the uh, layers of the vagina and muscularis of the bladder, and we close those layers uh, independently using fine, uh, fine sutures, uh, and we've uh, seen uh, success rates on the order of 95%, uh, doing a, probably about 10 to 15 of those cases a year. Um, for people in this country, I guess, uh, the fistulas that you hear about are the ones that are sub-Saharan, and they're very large obstetric fistulas. In our uh, setting uh, in the US, the fistulas we tend to have are those that come as a result of attempts at hysterectomy, uh, sometimes with lap laparoscopic hysterectomy and cautery, uh, causing burns that are later recognized as fistulas. They tend to be smaller, more apically oriented, and probably easier, well, definitely easier to repair and amenable to the robotic procedure. So this went from a multi-hour procedure, open, uh, multiple teams, to a routinely hour and a half procedure that's not done uh, with the robot uh, and the patient goes home the day after surgery. What you're seeing here is that we're using a 4-0 uh, vicral suture to basically uh, close the first layer uh, in an imbricated layer uh, of the fistulous tract and then we'll close subsequent layers uh, also with 4-0 vicral and then uh, close the vagina. Of late, uh, with the advent, and I know there's been a lot of uh, transvaginal mesh placements here in, in Europe as well, we've started to have complications related to transvaginal mesh, supposedly minimally invasive vaginally placed mesh to suspend uh, the vaginal cases of prolapse. Uh, because they're blindly placed, the mesh doesn't always know where it belongs. And so in this particular case, this patient uh, ended up with a sliver of uh, mesh uh, traversing through the rectum. Uh, for us, normally that would have meant a colorectal uh, type procedure, probably with a um, resection of the colon, removal of the mesh, reanastomosis with the consummate threats of colostomy bags and reversals, etc. In this particular case, because the mesh uh, uh, transgression was confined to the distal rectum, we're able to identify it uh, transrectally, make a uh, full thickness incision in the uh, rectum, identify the mesh, dissect it out to the left and right uh, walls of the rectum all the way through, and completely excise this. This particular patient uh, was a 50-year-old woman uh, who underwent a mesh procedure for anterior wall prolapse, who ended up uh, 
having this uh, blood in the stool and then uh, was evaluated on a colonoscopy and said to have a lesion, which it turned out to be the, uh, the, the mesh going through. This particular procedure took about an hour and a half to do. Uh, the rectum uh, was closed in multiple imbricating layers. Uh, the patient passed gas on post-op day number one and went uh, home uh, also on post-op day number one did well. Other things that we've been able to accomplish uh, using the, uh, the robotic system with the appropriate uh, level of experience operator uh, was that now we're able to go after uh, retropubic and uh, transoptorator type splints uh, in the space of retias uh, when they're um, too difficult to access transvaginally. Specifically for retropubic splints, including autologous splints, uh, as you know, the challenge sometimes is that they can be too tight and sometimes too loose. And when we find they're too tight, we can now enter the space of retias, uh, dissect the bladder down off of the synthesis, find the arms of the sling, and actually either squeeze the, uh, the sling or actually tighten it. Uh, we've been successful with those as well. Patients have also come to us asking for complete resection and removal of retrocuted slings, and we'll be able to accomplish those 100% uh, of the time as well. And so, in terms of data, the scientific meaning is supposed to say something. Uh, 75 hysterectomies a year in our practice uh, compared to now open single couple pexies completely flipped over. Um, I'm sorry, hysterectomy 75, three opens versus 150, robotic single couple pexies, uh, 10 vesovaginal fistulas a year, and resections of res uh, misplaced mesh, probably about 12 to 15 of those a year. Our single couple pexy rate, we're pretty uh, happy with. We're stuck, stay, we've stayed in the 95% success rate. Complications have been minimal. Mesh erosion is about 3%. Uh, uh, and the big advantage of uh, mesh erosions with robotic sacral copopexy is we can go with the robot and also get them out uh, successfully 100% uh, of the mesh. So uh, that's uh, where we are today. Uh, it's not quite microsurgery in terms of tubal reanastomosis or DAS. Uh, repair, uh, but it allowed us to do a class of procedures that we couldn't otherwise do uh, from an open or even microscopic perspective. So, thank you for your time. If you have questions, I'll take them.